There we go. Okay. okay. Well, all right. Everybody, there we go. So, uh, well, welcome everybody to uh, to the Bridge Online. So we're getting towards the towards the end of the year right now. So we have this uh, talk today, Peggy. And, um, and that's, uh, we're really happy to be having Peggy. And if you don't already know, Peggy is also our graduation speaker this year uh, for the high school ceremony uh, next week. And um, most of you already know about Green School, so we will not um, talk <laughs> anymore um, about Green School. And you are all very familiar with the bridge and the talks and the programs and the workshops and, and everything that, that, we, that we have been doing. And I do just want to highlight, you know, for those on the call, tomorrow we actually have another talk on the, um, the issues that are kind of facing the world on social injustice and racial injustice, the, the, what's been happening with George Floyd. And we're bringing that discussion to Bali and Indonesia and the, and the Green School community. So we really would love to have you on that uh, call for tomorrow um, as well, too. And, you know, just for so from basic logistics, we're, you know, we're kind of a small, medium-sized group today. Uh, so as we get into questions and things like that, if it stays roughly the size, we can be pretty fluid at the end, asking Peggy questions and, and various things. If the group gets bigger, then we'll look to moderate that with putting questions up on the, on the chat and everything. But we're really, really happy to have Peggy here today. And just if you don't know, although I think most of you have been reading about Peggy in our newsletters, you know, she's originally from Venice Beach in California, and she was the only Z girl amongst the Z boys, you know, that revolutionized skateboarding in the 1970s. And I'm from California, and I was not a very good skateboarder, but I was a skateboarder. And so uh, that was a really amazing time kind of growing up in California and sort of seeing these movements and things like this and, and what, was ha what was happening. And she was part of the movie, the very famous movie, Dogtown and the Z-Boys, um, which if you haven't seen, is a really fascinating insight you know, into, um, in, into um, her story, into her world. She went to Santa Barbara and she studied environmental biology and art. And for the past many decades, you know, she has really been just making a career out of activism and conservation and art. And we really saw that this week where we've been making origami whales, um, you know, by the hundreds, if not thousands, um, by everybody in the, in the community. Papa, for the past but 25 you, years. Talking, she, you want to listen? For the past 25 years, okay. she's been an activist. Oh, if, if someone could actually, if we just get you to mute a little bit there, we have someone, are we good? Oh, there we're good. Um, for the past 25 years, you know, she's been an activist for whales and dolphins, and she has just really been empowering children and adults and just been a role model, you know, for, I'd say, women, you know, in particular, um, in terms of, you know, what she's been doing. Um, anyways, it's just, she is a really wonderful person. We're really happy to be having uh, Peggy here as our graduation speaker, and we just thought this would be a nice opportunity to have a little bit more of an intimate um, um, discussion um, with Peggy, who, if case you're interested, is in the Skateboard Hall of Fame. So uh, she's a pretty cool person. <laughs> so anyways, let's give a nice warm welcome to Peggy. And uh, we're really happy to have you here today, Peggy. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris. I, thank you for the, the very nice in, uh, announcement and introduction to me. Uh, so today my talk is going to be on, uh, uh, it's titled, COVID-19, Climate Change, and That Guy. <laughs> Are we in this together? Uh, I'm going to start uh, with a, a sharing a bit about, about my experience, and then, and then I'll go into a, a screen share mode in, a, in just a couple minutes. I was in New Zealand from uh, late January. And then, of course, watching the news and uh, went into the whole lockdown experience while I was in New Zealand. And it was quite a strict lockdown level. They, they went from level four, three, two, they're now in level one, which is great. Uh, but it, I was, it was really, uh, you know, a time, I think, that for a lot of people, for most people, I mean, how many people here 
were reading news about this COVID and felt like didn't feel concerned, right? I mean, the the, the just the mysteries and the all the uncertainty of of the asymptomatic nature of this of this virus and how people were dying. I mean, I I think that everybody here. Um, had some level of fear, including myself. I was being very careful. I was so self isolated. And then I, and then I, uh, in mid April, realized that I really did need to get back to the States. I felt I was safer there, doing the more responsible thing to stay in New Zealand. And by responsible, I meant uh, not getting into a crowd situation, not sitting on a, on a long flight, but I had to do it. So uh at the end of april april 30th i went to auckland airport with my gloves my <laughs> my mask on my hand sanitizer uh checked in uh, all of the, the precautions on this flight and uh landed into lax and i decided that i was going to take the steps the stairs walking up to the immigration level of the airport because I like to stretch my legs and get exercise. Besides that, I was the only person on the stairs. Everybody else was on the escalator. So everybody was respectfully on their own space on the steps of the escalator when this, when this guy just rushed by running, no, like not running, walking very fast up the escalator right next to everybody, pretty much touching everybody that he passed. <laughs> during this time that we're asked to do social distancing. And so here I go sharing the, hang on, I'm gonna share the screen. I gotta do, I gotta do this, it's gonna take a couple steps. So, blah, 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 blah. there, share, okay. And then I'm gonna have, and then I go here and, okay. All right, so you know, I, we are one of the things that was supposed to make us all feel better is we will beat this together, just social distancing, and we're gonna we're gonna all cooperate and 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 look after one another. And then there was that guy. Is everyone able to see the screen now? Okay. Yep, it looks all great. Right. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so. We, you know, this is, this whole thing is global. It's affecting pretty much everybody on the planet, except for perhaps maybe some people in the most remote islands. And I, and I came back to more news. I, I had a lot more access to the, to the internet when I came back uh, and saw news like this, just heartbreaking stories. And it just, oh, wow. And then following, uh, for example, Democracy Now!, because I think they were a very reliable news source, and they reported that that scientists were uh, from the University, University of Oxford, I believe, were, were saying that they're estimating 135,000 deaths by August in the U.S. alone. Uh, there's a resource online called Worldometer, and I checked today. And as you can see, the number of deaths is already at 113,701. So I think that we are gonna meet that prediction before August, uh, sadly, and hopefully hopefully not. But we have to be careful about this, this thing. I, I'm practicing my social distancing and wearing my mask and all the, the precautions, and, but we're all experiencing inconveniences. Has there anybody here watching right now that has not experienced any inconvenience from this pandemic. You know, I, I just can't imagine. Um, and one of the big, big things that's happened in the United States has been loss of job, loss of job and income. It's, it's, it's massive, it's, it's practically historic. For me, one of the big inconveniences was my semi-annual trip, primitive camping out in the desert, rock climbing with my friends, and just cooking meals together with my friends, having this wonderful time in this beautiful desert that I don't, didn't get to go to this year. But that's really, you know, and then of course there's, there's things like getting together with friends and sharing delicious meals. And so those things just didn't happen. Uh, but that's small compared to getting sick with this virus. Uh, and, and people, you know, everyone I'm sure can share, in, you know, have, have thoughts right now of what has 
been their inconveniences that, that we've experienced. I'd like to share this because what we've been doing and this thing about we are all in this together, uh, it, it reminded me of what I had learned in history about, about, about personal sacrifices during the war. There was so much of, of this whole thing about patriotism and, and, and sacrificing for the war effort. And uh, so, he, so I'm going to read from this article that was in the New York Times Magazine. Americans received their ration cards in 1942, and rations were imposed on things like cars, tires, nylon, and firewood. What was the public response to that? Certainly, nobody likes having the family car put up on blocks for the duration of the war. Pleasure drives in the countryside were more or less outlawed. Does that sound familiar? The government wanted the rubber from your tires. Well, that hasn't happened to us yet, has it? <laughs> you weren't going to be able to get gas. So those were just some of the things that, you know, that I'm, I just thought I, I would share that. And then towards the end, it says, landlords weren't happy about rent controls. It's a big country, so there's always going to be anomalies. But most Americans realize these things were probably necessary for the war effort and we're, and we're willing to go along. So we, I'm asking everyone to think, do we have sacrifices that we've made and how much longer are we gonna be making these sacrifices and experiencing inconveniences and what can we do? One of the things that I've been watching in the news has been food safety. And we can see that, you know, most people probably has, have, have, have have the people here in this meeting seen the news about um, the slaughterhouses and the meat packing and food processing plants with the, the high cases of the COVID? Um, uh, this was from earlier on. And then in May, it says that at least 7,535 workers were confirmed to be sick and 37 have died. And then five weeks later, just uh, today, I looked it up and there's this there's this website called Food and Environment Reporting Network, which uh, I, I, I think is, is a very good resource. And I'll, I'll go back to this map. We can see this map from five weeks ago and to now. And the COVID has been spreading despite safety measures. You know, these, these food processing meat packing companies, they're making money by selling their food. And so they're going to want to do everything they can to keep operating. And they put all these safety measures into effect and they're still getting, having workers get sick. And now the death toll is about 120. It's tripled in five weeks. So it's been something to look at. Now, one of the things that some people here, hopefully, ha has anyone here seen some of the good news that, that came out? Oh, I guess it was around May about how, how in China they were starting to see clear skies and how in India for the first time people were seeing the Himalayas. And I thought, wow, this is great. And people are gonna realize that if we just cut back on our fossil fuel usage that, that, that we, can, we can actually halt climate change. And then I came across this article from the United Nations News that they have a report saying, <laughs> The expected drop in greenhouse gas emissions linked to global economic crisis caused by COVID-19 was only short-term good news. Uh, the scientists had did the, done their calculations. So what will we do about climate change? Is Mother Nature giving us a wake-up call? That's what I've been asking. Uh, we've seen the fires that have gone rampant in Australia. We've seen news about the Amazon burning at unprecedented rates. And it's been really heartbreaking for me to, to know about so much of the Amazon forest being burned and the loss of species every day going extinct because of what's happening in the Amazon. Uh, it says, from that, this article that I, that I just pulled from, from this one here, from Green Queen, it says, many of these farmers in Brazil deliberately set wildfires in order to deforest land for more cattle ranching to meet global demand for beef or to grow cheap soybeans 
as used for livestock and, and, and Hong Kong happens to be one of the biggest importers of Brazilian beef in the world. Which led to another article that I went to, because I, I always like to present solutions. If there's going to be problems, we've got to talk about solutions. And we can't just leave people bummed out, you know, just going, well, that's really a bummer. You know, we can do something. So there's an article I can provide links and resources at, after this talk to anybody who would like them. So uh, one of the, so it says eight things you can do to help with the, the issue of the uh, re reinforced uh, Amazon destruction. And then second, okay, the first item is boycott Brazilian beef, especially if you're in Hong Kong or China. Well, I'm not in Hong Kong or China. Most of us are not in Hong Kong or China right now. So let's go to item number two, boycott meat products altogether. While some might choose to boycott Brazilian meat products, until credible action has been taken by the Bolsonaro administration, there is good reason to simply opt out of all meat products. In the long term, eliminating the intake of meat would not only challenge the main source of deforestation all around the world, but would tackle our current biodiversity crisis, land and soil erosion, water pollution, and reduce carbon emissions. In addition, Going veggie could counter companies responsible for deforestation that have simultaneously been linked to modern day slavery and grave human rights abuses. Probably a good idea to ditch the beef burger for a plant-based patty. So that was just, I'm just reading from that article. How, you know, we, I think everyone here knows how important the forests and the jungles and the trees are to life on this planet. It's just, it's just imperative. We can't live without having our forests and our trees. And ironically enough, quite a while ago, I, I, I felt a, a sort of correlation, whether it's true or not, that the coronavirus has been causing lung disorders. And that's what people have been dying from, these lung disorders. And so that goes back to that question, is Mother Earth sending us a wave of call? We're, we're, we're destroying mother nature's lungs and the, this virus is basically attacking the human lung. I can't imagine mother nature having such a vengeful spirit and, and saying, we're gonna create this virus and, and attack people's lungs. But I'm just having just sort of like this time of reflection and correlation. And uh, so then I also came across a Scientific American article uh, stopping deforestation can prevent pandemics. And it says here the SARS uh, Ebola and now SARS-CoV-2, all three of these highly infectious viruses have caused global pandemic, global panic since 2002 and all three of them jumped to humans from wild animals that live in dense tropical forests. So as we are destroying these forests and, and human habitation and human activity is closer to areas that previously didn't have human contact, those viruses are coming to us. So I'm gonna just go through these, uh, these items. Has, any, has, ever, has anyone here, can I get a, 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 maybe a show of hands or something? I don't know if I can see everybody's hands. Has everybody here seen the documentary Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret? Okay, I see one show of hands, I see two show of hands. There might be more, but I can only see a few on the on the, the, the participant screen. People need to turn on your video so we can see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I um I highly recommend this film. And for anybody who cares about the environment, uh, including climate change, ocean pollution, ocean dead zones, water pollution, uh, habitat loss culling wildlife such as wolves, coyotes, eagles, uh, prairie dogs, uh, all sorts of, of wildlife are being culled in relation to the cattle industry. Uh, what else? Overfishing, um, the ocean, ocean acidification. This do documentary covers a lot of ground and I think that it's really important uh, for people to consider. Uh, as I said, it talks about the, the beef and how so much land mass, it says here, 45% uh, of global surface 
and 60% of the world's, uh, can't read my thing, is, is, so there's this, there's this document, you know, as part, as part of doc, the documentary Cospiracy, it's one acre per second in the Amazon that's getting destroyed for the cattle industry. So, I, you know, I showed the images of the, of the Amazon being burnt. Just to give you an idea, one acre per second is being destroyed. And so, you know, this is, this is something from a, uh, one of those annoying vegans. <laughs> Don't pray for the Amazon, go vegan. <laughs> So just, you know, there, there are a lot of people out there trying to get the message across. So this is a meme from Cowspiracy. So we can think, oh, well, that's happening in the Amazon. It's not happening in the U.S., but actually two, approximately 260 million acres of U.S. forest have been cleared in order to create cropland to produce feed for animals raised for food. And this is the comparison of the impact of a, of a plant-based, 100% plant-based or vegan diet, the, the, that, uh, how much it would uh, require in land to feed one person per year. And you can see the tiny little green dot on the top. And then if you're vegetarian, but still eating things, other animal products such as uh, eggs or dairy, which include cheese and ice cream and all those things, that would be vegetarian. It'd be three times as much land, but still when you compare it to the bottom block, that's 18 times as much land that's required to feed an omnivore each year. And then again, another uh, meme from Cowspiracy, 70% of uh, agriculture land, agricultural land is used for raising livestock, 50%, 30% of the planet's uh, land surface is used for land livestock, and it accounts for 20% of the total terrestrial animal biomass. We, we, we also have to consider not only the loss of forests, but the amount of greenhouse gas that is emitted from raising cattle. It, it's, it's just crazy to compare the transport, transportation sector contributing 13% of global greenhouse emissions, and then the cattle from all their, their farts. I'm gonna just say farts, There's, you know, cattle farts and poos and everything, 18%. That's, that's just sh sh phenomenal and shocking. And then here's another uh, comparison from an another organization, Climate Nexus, comparing the amount of, of crop lands and, and replacing beef with plants, what, what impact, how much your impact would be reduced. You can see on the left, is, is if you're gonna be eating animal products versus on the right, if you're eating a plant-based diet. And, and then the percentages are in the middle, how much of an impact you would have by just changing your diet. So climate change is caused by two things, human activity and human inactivity. <laughs> so inactivity as in not, not doing as much as we can as humans on this planet. And University of Oxford, came out with some numbers here. If the world went vegan, it could save 8 million human lives by 2050, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by two thirds and lead to healthcare related savings and avoided climate damages by $1.5 trillion. So healthcare related savings is talking about, about how much healthier you can be if you eat healthy plant-based diets. Um, there's junk food vegans and I was one of so I mean, I'm eating a lot healthier now. And what really was, has been fantastic is people coming out, people who know what's going on. I mentioned Sylvia Earle in my uh, talk for the World Oceans Day, uh, saying that she's not eating fish because you can consider them as wildlife of the sea and how the oceans are becoming so depleted. And here, uh, Jane Goodall has come out and said, we're finished if we don't alter our food systems. And I... I'm not able to read this quote uh, from my screen, but I think everybody here can see what she had to say about the consumption that we have of farm animals and how that's impacting the environment. And uh, I think she also mentioned uh, the, pan the spreading of pandemic. So I went on to the vegan calculator. It's, it's online, I can provide that link if you want, or you can, if you just, Google, if you just, oh, I'm gonna share another resource. If you do a search, 
for a vegan calculator. I entered one month. If you go one month, just try one month of being on a plant-based diet, you will have saved 30 animals, but you will also have saved 620 pounds of CO2, 913 square feet of forest saved, grain, 1,370 pounds of grain saved, and here's a whopper, 33,000 481 gallons of water are saved by going on a plant-based diet. If you are on a plant-based diet for one year, of course, multiply that by 12 and you get these numbers. Um, so for forest, you've saved 10,957 square feet of forest, uh, 16,436 pounds of grain, and that's where they're talking about saving lives because of the world hunger situation and the amount of grain that if you're not eating it, then other people can consume it. And then the water, the whopping water statistic for one year of being on a plant-based diet, 401,766 gallons of water. It's quite stunning. You know, you can go to the vegan calculator uh, website and enter one week. And just well, I think no, I think it's month, so it's only by a month. So that and then there's the URL there. And people, more and more people are trying the Beyond Burger now. I do not recommend the Impossible Burger. People like both of them, but there's been some issues with the Impossible Burger. And if anybody here is concerned about GMO, genetically modified organisms and glyphosate, which is the scientific name for Roundup. The Impossible Burger has tested positive for glyphosate and is made of GMO um, produced foods, so uh, uh, ingredients. And so I would recommend the Beyond Burger if anybody's interested in trying it. I had one and I went, oh my gosh, this is really like the real thing because uh, my friends, brought one to me at camp back in Utah last year and they said you gotta try the Beyond Burger it's just like meat I go okay and I went "Ooh, it really is it's kind of creepy <laughs> after after so long of not eating meat it's uh, I'm eating a lot of other meat alternatives that I, I enjoy uh, and uh, there's this whole thing about well how where do I get my protein and look at all those skinny vegans and all this I'm just gonna share that there are a lot of bodybuilders that are vegan out there and there's a documentary called The Game Changers. How many here have seen The Game Changers documentary? Yeah, what did you think? Yeah, pretty, pretty impressive. And so uh, I, I'm just sharing these, these different aspects of going plant-based now, the, the, the food options that, that when I would go to parties looking for, for food that was vegan friendly, there actually was a lot of things to eat, lots of veggies and things. And, and how to start uh, with with this? This is this is uh, on the in the center. It's it's uh, a meme that Miguel the vegan uh, quote posted. Where am I going to get my protein? Well, actually, that whole thing about protein is is somewhat of a myth, and you can also Google or not Google. I'm going to say search engine uh, the protein plant based uh, myth and just find out for yourself. But I've been, I love nuts. Oh my gosh, I'm just a nut for nuts. And so I eat lots of nuts. I, I eat some chia seed. I, uh, I also eat hemp seed. It's a good source, that and chia seed and black seed are a good source of the omegas because people have been taking a fish oil type of uh, supplements for omegas and you can get that instead from things like hemp seed. So when you're, if you are thinking about being vegan, if you aren't already, it's important to think about nutrition because as I said, I was somewhat of a junk food vegan for a while and I wasn't thinking as much about my nutrition and now I'm thinking more about it. I'm, I'm, I'm proactive about, about making sure that I'm getting my omegas and uh, look at this mind blowing number at the bottom. Can everyone see the pumpkin seeds? How much protein is in pumpkin seeds? And pumpkin seeds are super high in fiber, so they're, they're a really healthy thing to, to eat. Who would have thought? And then, of course, as I say, being a junk food vegan, um, these, these food items here, they're not like they're junk food, but 
they're not as pure as eating fresh fresh vegetables and fruits and nuts and and eating fresh vegetables and fruits is a big important part of staying healthy and i do eat a couple cups of steamed broccoli every night along with something like a chopped up tofurkey italian sausage or <laughs> with garlic saute with garlic I, uh, I kind of lost my interest in cheese, uh, so I don't eat much cheese substitutes, but I really like Miyoko's, and her smoked cheeses are really good. And then, of course, there's nut, nut and, and grain-based milk alternatives. Uh, and then, of course, the desserts. <laughs> there's so many people out there making vegan desserts now and vegan ice cream. Uh, there is just incredible. I would, I just, yeah. So here I am, the skinny vegan. Um, <laughs> I've been vegan for 20 years and very athletic. I've, I've always been athletic from, from even way before the time I was skateboarding on the Zephyr team with my teammates and uh, surfing. I've been really into rock climbing for about the last 15 years. I started climbing over 20 years ago. This is me on uh, one of the, the routes in Indian Creek stuff. It's from Utah that I really love. It's, it's just such a, a beautiful place. Just wanted to show you my calves. <laughs> and now my abs. <laughs> so there, that whole thing about the protein myth, it's just, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a myth. And for anybody who's interested, I, you know, I'm presenting resources. There's this app that you can get on your phone called Happy Cow. And if you're looking for a restaurant that's, that has different vegetarian or vegan options, that it's a great resource. I, I came across a great vegan Vietnamese food restaurant in Reseda, California, when I was at the climbing gym. And after um, climbing with my partner, we my climbing partner, we were looking for a vegan place to eat and there it was. And oh my gosh, I keep going back there whenever I can. And then, uh, and then there's Veganuary. If you go online, you can find Veganuary. And then there's Forks Over Knives, which is uh, from a documentary. And they've, they've got recipes and, oh boy, yum, tamales. Uh, there's also, for search engines, I just came across this today. I wanted to share this because because sure, we are, you know, there's people like me who are willing to be plant-based. Uh, my main reason is ethical reasons, but also for environmental reasons. But while I was searching for, for various resources, I came across ecosia.org. And as you can see here, they, they seem to be a very environmentally conscious company. And, and Working with local partners, they've planted over 60 million trees through 20 projects uh, across 15 different countries as of June 2019. And it's not maybe as convenient right now. I've only just started today to use Ecosia after I learned about them. Uh, I need to set it up somehow so that I can instantly go there, but it's pretty quick for me to find. Um, I just start entering ECOS and then it goes, it starts, my browser starts going to Ecosia. So I'm, I'm recommending that. Check it out and see if it's something that you might want to look into because I, I feel good about going through a search engine that does good stuff like that. We're all about solutions. We're all in this together. I found all kinds of needs. We're all in this together. So I wanted to share this. We are all connected on this planet. Everything that we do, all of our choices that we make are part of what we're doing for the planet and to the planet. And I just keep hoping that the humanity will, will wake up to the opportunity that we have as we've had so much time to ourselves in isolation and to reflect, to, to gather information. <laughs> it's everyone's choice. <laughs> And I, and, I, and I really love this quote, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. I really believe that it's up to us as individuals, as organizations, 
and as schools. And that's what I love so much about Green School Bali. Just, just the collective work in educating and inspiring and empowering the youth. And yeah, it's just wonderful. There's a, as I, as I was talking in this whole, whole talk about the connection between uh, loss of habitat, deforestation, and of course there's the wet markets. Um, this, uh, there's a short three minute documentary film, I, I guess it's, it's a campaign film, extinctionendshere.org. Uh, there's a little bit of some uh, graphic imagery in it, but not, not a whole lot, but it's, it's quite a powerful three minute video and it has a pledge on it uh, that you, you know, you're, you're making a declaration to end the trade of wildlife. And that, and that's it for my keynote part with the visuals. I'm going to go back to share, resume, sh oh, stop share. Okay. And I'm here uh, ready for any Q&A if anyone wants to talk. I, I'd love to talk with everybody about, about your thoughts and um, yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you uh, so much, Peggy. And it's, you know, it's kind of remarkable that you're showing uh, Dr. Jane Goodall, who was one of our graduation speakers at Green School. And we've really had some amazing, wonderful people speaking, speaking at Green School. And so anyways, I think it's just so wonderful that you are the speaker this year with not just the impact that you had you through your skateboarding and through uh, everything you've done there, but just continuing and living the lifestyle. And <clears throat> I think just a great example for, for all of us. I mean, our family, I was pointing up that we were vegan for 10 years and I think you're guilting me back into for all the right <laughs> reasons to go back to being vegan. So uh, anyways, <clears throat> I think, I think we need to do that. So, but anyways, but we have um, a nice group of people here and who, as I look at this group, doing some amazing things. So who has uh, some questions for Peggy? We're a small enough group. I can't see if you don't have your video on, I can't see your hand, but if you want to use the hand gesture, then just turn on reactions and just raise your hand. But if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll just kind of do this as a little bit fluid, okay? So. Okay, okay, great. And I would like to add, uh, thank you for mentioning that Jane Goodall was one of your graduation speakers. She was an inspiration to me as a child. I was watching nature documentaries and, and she was starting to do her work studying chimpanzees. And I, and I, I went, man, this woman, and, and I really, I, I've emulated her approach ever since seeing her when I was a child as far as how to approach animals all animals, dogs, cats, horses, wild animals, anything. You just very respectfully offer yourself and just, she's, she's such an inspiration to me. And so it's yeah. been wonderful to see things like, like that article that I just came across recently and I went, wow, right on. Yeah, well, she yeah. is, she is, uh, she is wonderful. And she said she wishes that she had a, a place like green school when, when she was little. And uh, mm. we obviously won't get the opportunity with you this year, but after she completed her graduation speech, she started running around <laughs> on the field and doing little circles. And it was just, uh, oh. it, was, it, was, it was fantastic. So oh. that, it's, that's, that's great that you're doing, doing her work. Yeah. Okay, so um, from the audience, you can either post on your chat or just raise your hand and we can go around and ask uh, Peggy some questions. Uh, go ahead, Joe and Jerome. So go Joe and then Jerome. Peron. Uh oh, sorry, I didn't mean. Go ahead, go ahead Jerome. Am I going? Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm. I'm just. This may be a little personal for you, but um, I'm just so. It's so inspiring seeing um, people stay so active. I find that um, once we get beyond forty, I mean fifty, things just start to decline. And I was kind of curious. What's your impression of other people kind of north of 50 and women compared to what you're doing and versus like, what's your like illness, medications? <laughs> like what are, 
what's your opinion on what happens to us as we get older in the whole psychology of being less active just because we're getting older and yet somehow what's your advice well i am 64 and i as i said i've been vegan for uh 20 years and i gradually became vegan at a uh, I gradually became an official vegetarian. I started maybe 35 years ago, just gradually cutting out meat and then officially vegan about 20 years ago. So I've been on a, a relatively healthy diet. And another thing is staying active. I, I, I physically active and environmentally active <laughs> or as an activist basically engaged. So I make it a point to exercise pretty much every day. It's rare that I don't exercise, uh, that I miss a day. I do yoga pretty much every day. I've been doing yoga for over 20 years, pretty much every day. I, I just make time for these things. These are like, these are to, as important to me as eating. <laughs> feeding your soul, feeding your wellness by exercising, doing yoga, getting your stretches in. And being an activist for me, it just, it's my, I feel that I'm, I'm fulfilling a purpose. And so, I think that that just, it just keeps me going and, and to not give up and to be inspired uh, and to just not let things get me down, to not let the news bring me down to the point where I feel like I have no power because we all have a power to make a difference. We really do. And whatever that we do best, we can make a difference. And, and so as far as when you get to being a bit older and if you're finding that you're having some some health cha challenges did you see the documentary game changers and what the health because those they were talking about people's lives being transformed by just going plant-based and you know for me i was not as interested in the health reasons but watching those documentaries i went wow that's really quite fantastic and um I mean, that's all I, I can I can really say is just trying to to live healthy by those those things that, that and as I said, exercise is so important. Really, yeah. That's great, and I know uh, Heron, you have a question, but I just there's two more health questions uh, that came up on the chat uh, just because what one question is of your 20 years of being vegan. Do you occasionally cheat? I think you already answered that question a little bit. Any dairy, meat, et cetera. If so, how do you feel physically? Um, I don't cheat. I haven't cheated. That. Oh, you don't cheat? Okay, go. there uh -oh. you go. <laughs> no, I've, I've, been, I've said junk food vegan, but that's only oh, okay. because, I, because mm -hmm. I, I liked things like lots of potato chips. <laughs> potato chips are really not very healthy. They're delicious, but they're not very healthy. Um, and 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 things like things like that so i i i pretty much watch my diet now as far as things that are highly processed i'm trying not to eat too many highly processed foods but i do like i said enjoy something like the tofurkey sausage but i eat tempeh as my my part of my dinner every other night just cook it different ways okay that's great yeah. and just one more before we we pass on uh, to, uh to, <laughs> Um, Sunny wants to know what is your favorite butt milk and <laughs> butt milk. I, I just had to say it because that's what she wrote, <laughs> but then she, typo. but then she, she did correct herself and say nut milk, but I just thought uh -huh. that was pretty damn funny. So what is your favorite butt milk or nut milk? So. <laughs> uh, I love, I, I haven't tried a whole ton. But I do, I, I have enjoyed the uh, cashew and macadamias and uh, uh, my, I primarily uh, drink almond milk, which does require more water to produce versus uh, some of the other nut milks, but not as much as regular milk, <laughs> not as much as dairy milk, yeah. Okay, all right, well, I've been holding you off. Personal all right. taste, everybody oh. needs to find, find, you know, try different ones and see which one they like the best. I like the oat milks too, you know, but I, um, yeah. That's great. All right, head on, go ahead. I've been cutting you off too much, go. Oh, no, that's okay, that's okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. I, I actually didn't have a question, but since you're cold calling me, I, I was kind of scratching my head quickly to find, find a question, and I uh, always, uh, 
have questions um, and questioning myself and, and the planet. And so thank you so much for this uh, fantastic uh, speech and, uh, and uh, workshop uh, at the same time. Um, I have a question which is, uh, uh, I mean, I, we're all kind of in this story um, and, um, but I also try to find um, a good answer to the question that my children are asking, which is what is actually going well in the, on the planet? How can, I, how can I kind of give my kids some data, some, some story that, uh, of course, I try myself, but I would like to hear you hear, have your answer on what is the, what are the bright, what's the bright side? What's going well? What, uh, I mean, what's this picture? Yeah, there, there are some things that are going well. I, even, even with these really sad things going on more recently since the outbreak of the pandemic, we've also been looking at this whole racial inequality the the police violence and things in, in the united states and and uh as a result of that there's more and more people becoming aware and raising their voices and saying that that this is not acceptable and then as far as what's happening to the planet uh with this whole COVID thing i'm, I'm gonna back up to the issue of, of food safety and uh slaughterhouses and, and meat processing uh facilities with high cases of COVID, because people are, are and, and I only just found this out today, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, with all these, these meat packing, pl uh, you know, places having COVID, I wonder how many, and, and also less supply, I'm wondering if people are trying more of these plant-based alternatives, like the Beyond Burger or Field Roast brand, which is really good. Gardein brand is another delicious brand of, of, of meat alternatives. And people are. I just saw in this article that, that more and more people are trying the plant-based alternatives right now. And that means uh, that if we entered that into the vegan calculator, that it, you know, in a month of time, that much water and, and land, forest, and CO2 impact is being reduced. And, and, there, and then when, when I started to come up with this, this speech about a month and a half ago, I thought, geez, there's not many people talking about this. But since then, I've seen a few more videos. Of, I mentioned that Extension Ends Here uh, video. Well, now I've seen at least three, two or three other ones. And uh, there may be other ones that I haven't even seen yet. People are starting to, to raise awareness about the connection, about things like the swine flu, the avian flu, the SARS, these things coming from, from our manipulation of animals. And, and so it's, it's discouraging sometimes for me, but when I see this kind of news that, that people are trying more of these things and, and as the, the uh, um, availability of meat has fallen and the prices are gonna go up, people are gonna go, well, maybe I should try this other thing. And, and it will be better for the planet if people go, oh, that was delicious. I think we're gonna go plant-based. So there's, and, and in the last, okay, so I saw some reports a couple, like a year ago, that in the last uh, three years, the vegan market in the United States had gone up 500%. And in Australia, some other really high number of, of interest in that. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying this because I've been an ethical vegan and watching this and, and feeling like, okay, there's going to be less animals killed and that kind of thing. But it's also so much about the planet, you know, as I, as I presented in, in this, this talk. And so that's the good news that people are becoming aware People are, are, are trying the plant-based alternatives and hopefully they'll stick with it. Yeah. That's yeah, so great. thank you for asking the question. We definitely need to keep, keep our youth encouraged and empowered. Yeah. I yeah. totally agree. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Carol, I think you had a question, yeah? Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, thank you so much, Peggy, for the presentation. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. Uh, Peggy, I have a question for you. 
uh, what my first question is uh, when we talk about meat consumption uh, we also talking about uh, agriculture in parallel to that because I mean a lot of the food that is produced in our uh, world today is actually to feed the animals that we're gonna eat Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, and I'm from Brazil, I'm actually current in Brazil, so you mentioned oh, the Amazon goodness. in Brazil oh. yeah, a few times. And, and I've seen more than anything lately, actually, for the Amazon, because my parents also live there, is that the Amazon is going down a lot for soya production as well, like for grants, for agriculture yeah. reasons. Yeah. So, uh, and part of that, it's for... Um, it's for feed the animals for sure, but part of that is also to feed us as animal. Uh -huh. So, uh, so when we're talking about this change from one to, I mean, for for a diet more plant based, we also have to kind of look to, into how we are growing food because our yeah. current agriculture system is also a fail and it's also yeah. uh, part of the problem, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I want to know uh, uh, your opinion on, on that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, one of the things, if you if you were to do a search on ecosia.org, <laughs> uh, that website, the, the search engine that I recommended, is that, that if you were to compare the amount of soy that it takes to feed a plant, somebody on a plant-based diet versus how much needs to be fed to an animal, to get their meat it's way 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 more yeah so, but but then my my second question would be don't you think that maybe the path forward would be to be local like more than anything and to really act locally because i do think that when we think like like even we talk not talking about soya but when i'm thinking about eating quinoa in Bali that it's coming from Andes, you know, mm -hmm. and it's produced mm -hmm. somehow that we don't know, you know, maybe on yeah. large scale, you know, yeah. being transported and the energy that it's transported all the way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I don't know, like when you're talking about being vegan, when you think about communities that are still hunting on the indigenous mm -hmm. tribes, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're going to say, are you crazy? You know, like we hunt, <laughs> it's, it's a different... But when you're talking about being local and having available, if you go to Argentina, the pampas there, this is grease land. This is land for cows. So maybe people there should be okay to eat because that's, you know, the, that the area that you have production, you know, but uh -huh. maybe people that are in areas that don't have, that's not what. Yeah. So what do you think about like being local regard uh, movement? Yeah. Well, 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 first of all, it, it goes as far as, you know, these smaller communities and raising their own cattle. And it's, it's much, a, a much smaller if they were just to eat their own cow, even though that still does involve the amount of land and the amount of food they, that these animals eat and the, the, the uh, greenhouse emissions from them. It's a much smaller impact than the demands coming from a large country like the United States. Uh, and and the other thing is the embodied energy. So embodied energy is the amount of energy, like you're saying. So the, what is involved, how much energy is involved in producing that food that's going to be eaten? Is, is it, does it take a lot of, of uh, tractor t uh, sewing and all that uh, sort of thing, tilling? Uh, does it, and how much energy goes into pr processing the food? And then how much energy is shipping, like you're saying? quinoa grown in one country and then shipped all the way across to Bali. And that's, those are definitely factors to consider. The other factor is um, things like palm oil. Oh my gosh, we really, the palm oil's in so much that we don't even realize. It's in shampoo, it's in laundry soap, it's in, it's in dish soap, it's, it's of course in all, all sorts of the cheap foods and the snacks that, there's, that are being sold. And to, to really think about the, the impact and do research on palm oil and how, how we as individuals can avoid um, unsustainable palm oil. Uh, but going back to the local thing, uh, I think that that's a really valid point. And I, one of the things I posted on my Facebook wall just, just yesterday was how it's so important to do as much as we can to support local organic farming. 
local organic farmers because, because they're not using Roundup glyphosate, which I was mentioning earlier, which is in the Impossible Burger. And, I, and I've learned how bad, I mean, I knew it was bad, but I learned how bad it is even more so in the last couple of weeks, listening to uh, various experts like this triple, triple, M, triple board certified MD, uh, Dr. Zach Bush. And he, he also was interviewed regarding the coronavirus. But just thinking about regenerating the soil and binding CO2 and being going, go, you know, the, the, the local, I would say, is because then you have less, a lot less embodied energy. And then the organic is because you're not going to be using GMO and you're not going to be using these harmful pesticides that are really seriously impacting the, the health of the planet. Uh, and if anybody's, you know, curious, you could go visit his website. Uh, it's uh, if you Google or not Google. I keep saying I'm used to saying Google, and I just, like I said, just learned this new search engine today. But if you look up uh, Doctor Zach, Zach, Doctor Zach Bush, MD, he's got a website, and uh, visit his site about regenerative uh, agriculture and all. He's he's into a lot of different projects, but. Yes, I do. I do believe that that supporting as much local as we can is is a very helpful thing. That's yeah. great. That's a great thank you, um, Pac Francis. You had a question, but you posted it there. Would you like me to read it, or would you like to read your your question? Either way is fine. I just want to say hi to Peggy again. Um. <laughs> oh, hi, Pac Francis. <laughs> As I'm concerned, you're a superstar. I've even got you on my t-shirt. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, no, honestly, I, I, you know, I, I have, a, I have a, a young boy in grade six and, you know, he's, he's really upset about, you know, all these things going on in the world and he's, he, but he's really stressed if he doesn't finish his school assignments and his school uh -huh. assignments, are, you know, you know, write a historical fiction piece or, you know, do a bit of biology research on to cells. And, and, and he's, he's obsessed with not having, a, a bit like we are with our hand phones, we don't want the little red bubble that says we didn't read something. He can't stand it when he has an assignment that hasn't been done. And he's just, you know, this is his thing. And I would really like for him to go outside and go skating with me and then think about, sometimes we have these discussions at dinner, you know, and he's got this idea for a perpetual motion machine that you sink to the bottom of the ocean and it will create a vacuum that will create energy that will never end and all these wonderful things. And I think, and then he goes back to his schoolwork. How, how do I, as a teacher, how do I encourage him to do more of that wacky, crazy thinking and then put it into action and I mean, honestly, I'd be shooting myself in the foot if I told him, yeah, don't worry about distance learning online school. Let's just invent petrol, perpetual motion engines for the next, you know, two and a half months. Or <laughs> so how do I, how do, what's your advice on that, Peggy? Oh, I'm not, I'm not trained as a teacher, though. <laughs> My point, are we training people to do jobs that are, you know, things to the past that have you know, hurdles to jump through and grades to get and universities to go to in order for them to occupy these rather, you know, antiquated jobs, careers within a system. Yeah. How do we make school about thinking more about the environment and taking risks and being an activist? I mean, I think if my own son said to me, dad, I'm not going to go to school anymore. I'm going to be an activist. I'm going to drop out of school and I'm going to campaign outside the government. I'm not quite sure what I'd I'd be really proud, but I'd be like, son, how are you going to pay your bills and feed your children? Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. I mean, you decided to be an activist. That's what you are. That's who you are. And it's fantastic. And I just wonder how can we get more people to realize that you're, being an activist doesn't mean you're a dropout. It means you're actually a hero. Oh, yeah. I, there's, there's, there's so many people who... I would just say that the examples are, are out there. People like Dr. Sylvia Earle and Jane Goodall, and she was really quite a rebel, I guess. I guess you could call her a rebel. She was so outside the box in her, in her research, um, as you all know. But she's she followed a, that passion. I'm sorry? She's a rebel with a degree. Uh, yeah. And a she's yeah got, she's she, a, 
you know, maybe, uh, maybe I'm asking, do they have to become doctors first and then be activists? Or is there a way we can do it the other way around? I, I think that, that you can be an activist as long as you can afford it and, and somehow be supported in it. And somehow the universe is supporting me in this, you know, and I, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of, you know, and, um, I, I just think it's so important to follow your passion. So whatever your whatever if if your son is is just crazy passionate about something, to just keep following that because that's where where it's going to lead to something. I don't know. That's my my belief. And there's there's just people doing all sorts of things coming you know coming out from outside the box and just saying, okay, well, what about this idea? And how am I going to make this happen? And <laughs> I, I don't know. That's that's all I can think of. <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I had the magic answer. <laughs> well, well and, if I, I'd be rich and famous. <laughs> well, and I'd say, Pac Francis, I think you're a pretty amazing teacher that encourages people and gets the kids excited. And so I almost think your question is oddly rhetorical because I think, you know, any teacher that stands out front playing the darn ukulele in the morning inspiring people. I think, uh, I think you're a pretty good teacher and a pretty good dad in that, in that regards. So, <laughs> anyways, yeah. but it's, um, um, we're, we're, we're just, we're just beyond the hour. And, um, I do want to be appreciative of, of people's time, um, and, and everything. And, um, and, and Peggy, I just, one thing I just want to point out is on this call right here, there are a few of us who actually have students who are graduating this year. So, um, and I am one of them and my, my wife, Jo, is on the call as well too. And, you know, it's actually, it's really amazing, the, the, group, the group that's here. And uh, anyways, I, I think we're all really excited that you are the speaker to our kids who are graduating from from the school this year and just the role model that you are and how you have empowered people and then just been this example of someone just following your interests and everything you do. Um, anyways, I'm, uh, yes, Jane Goodall was great. And I think we are super excited about, about having you uh, as well too. So thank you so much for coming on our call today and sharing and being part of the Green School community this week. and. And um, I just wish we were all there physically to be there with you, um, you know, at this time, but we're doing as best we can with what we have. So thank you very much, Yes. Yeah, well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I, feel, I feel very honored to have this opportunity to, to share my little presentation and, and hope uh, it, it planted some food for thought for anybody who's been been considering and and if you'd like I, I have uh, various resource links that I can uh, send uh, what would be the best way to share them if anybody wants them should I email them to Sophie or yeah yeah yes yeah. send them to okay. Sophie and then uh, okay. Sophie can share them with Carol and we have a whole bunch of different means of, of getting them out yeah you you okay. shared so such great information today it'd be really nice to get that out to our to our community so all right great yeah. All right. And someone asked, can we receive the slideshow? I'm not sure if that is possible. Is that possible? Um, I could put the images in my, in a Google drive folder. Okay. Uh, well, maybe see if that's possible with, uh, yeah. with, uh, with Sophie or Carol, and then we can, we can figure that yeah. out. So. I mean, once, once we are sharing the recording, once it's recording, when she's presenting, we can see the slides. But yeah. yes. Okay. okay, that's great. All right, everybody. Well, thank you all for coming on the call today. And it's uh, always nice seeing seeing everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week, Peggy, when you give okay. your uh, give your graduation speech to the community. So thank you again right. for everything. Yeah. yeah? Thank you, Take Chris. Care, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>